Club Good, episode six. Oh, shit. Still the only podcast not sponsored by Manscaped. I'm pretty disappointed, to be honest. The balls are hairy. <laughs> Get in touch. <laughs> They're not. <laughs> We're in with Dwight O'Neill. What's up? What's going on? Oh, man, just just living. Living. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> living, yeah. Living is an actual thing, which yeah. is a, which is a, a surprise. Now, yeah. Yeah. We, we're, we're now following this whole idea of just getting people on that like nearly died. <laughs> yeah. So this is just becoming the near-death podcast. <laughs> <laughs> if you've seen any lights and walk towards them in the last sort of six, 12 years, reach You're out. In, please. <laughs> any near misses. We'll take anything. Um, Dwight, friend of mine for the longest time. Like a long time, yeah. Um, used to share a studio together. Yeah. Fellow GD. So I went to mm. America with you a few years back, like 2000 and 2010. Was 2010 yeah. yeah. So we went over and partied and everything. That was the first time I knew that you had any sort of pre existing illness. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned to me that you had a heart condition. Yep. And it was like, that's cool. You know, like it was just in passing. Yeah. I think we were just having a beer. Yeah, I suppose you weren't talking about how serious it was to anyone because I don't know if it was it that serious to you in the beginning. I mean, <clears throat> it was, but it was kind of, it was in the back of my mind. Like it, it wasn't really something that I thought about too much. It was, it was almost like something that happened in my childhood. I'd left it there, moved on. It was obviously, you know, a pretty serious thing, but um, yeah, I basically left it in my childhood pretty much. Was there stuff that you couldn't do? Yeah, so sort of younger on, you know, basically I had two open heart surgeries when I was very young, had a, a condition called situs inversus, which is a, a pretty rare condition in itself. I had kind of like a level plus, a level plus, a level plus version of that, which also affected um, my heart, the makeup of that. For the first, you know, probably 10 years, I wasn't allowed to run, skip, jump, all that sort of stuff, anything that would increase my heart rate. So, you know, I did the opposite, started playing b-ball, um, <laughs> got super fit. You know, the checkups went from annually to three years, five years. So through my twenties, I mean, it was kind of just like a faded memory, basically. Pretty normal existence. Completely normal. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was always sort of in the back of my mind, like, you know, subconscious type thing, but I didn't let it rule my life, put it that way. And you get confirmation bias, right? Because you're like, everything's going fine. Exactly. I'm doing the same shit as everyone else. Yeah. They told me I could never play ball. Yeah, you're not. Just... You're terrible at ball. So I don't know if that was something <laughs> yeah. that, that beep, was, beep that was a reason. So <laughs> 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 but yeah, 30s, that shit rocked you. I think I had my last checkup when I was 25. All was good. No issues. You know, completely normal dude. Partying heaps, traveling heaps, all that sort of jazz. Um, got to 30 went camping over in the redwood forest over in victoria got rained on pretty heavily like we were pretty shit at camping so didn't really come equipped got a cold got pretty sick fast forward about a month or so got sicker at that point i did sort of start to go is this a heart related thing a couple of weeks later get diagnosed with pneumonia um start getting sicker at this point i'm still going to work doing that tough guy male thing shrugging it off Meanwhile, I'm struggling to breathe, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, progressed to the point where there was a Game of Thrones finale night. We had some friends over. I was sort of starting to think, you know, this isn't, something's going on here. Like it's a bit, it's a bit sketchy. Like I'm not feeling too good. I'm struggling to breathe. I'm super fatigued. It's not good. All our friends that are left after the finale, I just basically sat there like a veggie. Like I was out of it basically. Just like, I can't believe Jon Snow killed Khaleesi. Like, yeah, exactly. That, just, that just anxiety deflated. of the finale just like <laughs> got to me. Yeah, and then basically sort of had a bit of a coughing fit. And, you know, my girlfriend, wife now was just like, yeah, we're going to fucking ER. Like I just couldn't breathe, couldn't walk. It kind of just happened really quickly. Sort of like a slow progression, but then it amplified really quickly. Got rushed to ER. And then from that, I was just straight into ICU. I had two and a half liters of fluids on my lungs. And what had happened was that pneumonia I'd, I was diagnosed with was actually heart failure. Um, so for the last kind of month or two, I was <laughs> literally fucking dying and just thought it was a cold. And just going to work. Yeah, just <laughs> going to work, just grinding, getting through the day. I didn't realize the extent of it. Did you have like exactly. a medical team 
Like I know I've got friends like Rach who's a cancer survivor and has diabetes and she has a medical team. When they moved to Melbourne, my understanding of it was that they needed to basically piece together a new medical team for her yep. because she's got so many complications. You can't just go to a GP. Yeah. They're not really going to understand all of those things. It's, mm. a, it's a number of specialists. I suppose because you were relatively out of the woods since you were a kid, you were just like the rest of us. You were just going to a normal GP. Yeah, exactly. So... I had some pre-existing teams, I guess, from when I was younger who had kind of moved around a bit, but I could sort of rattle off a couple of names, which a few of the doctors sort of knew of. So they got in contact with those guys because the problem was half of them didn't know how complicated my condition was as well. So they were trying to work out what the fuck was going on inside of me. They spoke to a few doctors, they diagnosed what was going on. I was, you know, kind of straight to ICU. I think it was about three or four days later, I was sort of in the bed, probably still thinking it was okay. I was so naive, you know, I was just like, all right, cool, bit of a cold, bit of a scare. Like, I'm cool. Like, I'll get out of here. And then one of the docs came in and was like, yeah, you need an immediate heart transplant. And I was just like, what the fuck? How old were you? I was like 31, which is pretty young, like... I mean, I go to clinic now and most people are 60 plus. Like it's it's pretty rare to get a heart and lungs transplant at 31. So yeah, that was definitely a bit of a shock. Um, again, stayed in that particular hospital for about, I think it was roughly two weeks. Um, and I'd, I'd been sort of pushed forward to Fiona Stanley where the heart and lung transplant team is. So I had a meeting with those guys and I sort of had about a week at home and I was massively just depleting. It was just... You couldn't do anything. I remember talking nah, to you at that nah, time and you were all. like, I can't get off the couch. Yeah, I was, I was so fatigued because, you know, with heart failure, you just dying, literally. So it's like you're so fucking tired to the point where you just can't think, you can't fathom what's going on basically. So I had a meeting with the heart team about a week later. By that time, I was deteriorating pretty rapidly. But still, in my mind, I was pretty positive thinking it's all good. Like, it's cool. I'm going to walk out of this and be totally fine. Like, it's still a bit of a cold. It's all good. Wait, so um, at that point, you still didn't really let it sink in that, that you were definitely in need of this? Or did they frame it in a way that you might not need it? Or how, how did that go? They, they're, they're pretty straightforward. Mm. Like, you need a heart transplant immediately. I think for myself, I was, I think I'm a pretty positive dude. And I just kind of looked at the upside and was like, oh, maybe I won't need it. You know, maybe something will change, maybe. And it wasn't until I sort of went to that meeting where it like became real. I was kind of sitting there chatting to the doc. They introduced me to the whole team. Seems like a project plan, not yeah, a... This is uh, like, this is a little bit weird. What's, what's not happening? A, not a scoping exercise. Yeah, <laughs> and then we're chatting and um, and he's like, your bed's ready. And I was kind of like thinking I was going home. We're taking you upstairs now. And literally that was, you know, the start of my hotel hospital. Mm. Like it was just, we didn't have bags, we didn't have toothbrushes, none of that sort of stuff. So just went straight upstairs and from that moment straight into testing living in hospital basically so from that point where you were like i'm going home it's going to be all right to them being like this is where you live now it's probably that moment that it clicked again i was probably just being a bit too naive a little bit too positive and i think that moment was the sort of crunch time where it was like the flick had switched and i was like all right this is pretty pretty serious they sort of mapped it all out for me and i think that was the time where i realized how i was actually feeling I think I was kind of just mentally blocking a lot of stuff. As soon as I went up to the room, it was, I had to actually realize what was happening and kind of like adapt to my whole thinking into survival mode, I guess, you know, and try and work out what do I do now? This isn't going away. I need to work out a plan. I need to face this. So she got real, I kind of just had to reframe everything. So you're like rapidly depleting still at this point. Your health's going down the toilet, your heart's failing. Are you starting to get concerned that, well, I, I'm assuming that you can't just go and get a heart. It's not going to be uh, an easy pickup. Are you concerned at any point along this, along this journey, I suppose, that it's it's going to be longer than you have left before your own gives out? Yeah. yeah, so did they give you likelihood? Did they say without a new heart you're going to be dead two weeks or? There wasn't like a timeline on it because I don't think they want to 
give you that information because it could potentially have a negative effect. How many times um, have you heard someone say, oh, you've got three weeks to live, but my grandma lived like seven months. Exactly, so like, yeah. Do they want to give you false hope? Do they want to give you no hope? Like they, they're yeah. fucked if they do, fucked if they don't, right? I think they do their job. They do everything within their power to keep you alive. Yeah. But, you know, you can kind of read between the lines. There was times where doctors were disagreeing with each other. Some pretty heavy shit was going on. And I'm just like, fuck. Like, <laughs> They're arguing I'm in the room. Life. Like, what's up? <laughs> how many people? How many people in this team? Oh, massive, man. In the transplant world, there's not many people that do heart and lungs. So you've got two teams, one for each. So originally I was in the heart team through the whole work up, up to the transplant. Then it kind of switched over and I went to the lung team. I'm not sure on the exact numbers, but let's just say 10 plus. Um, you know, and these guys that work at Fiona Stanley are like the best of the best. They're amazing. You kind of get to know them really well. You, you build a really good personal bond with them because you, you're going through this shit together. You know, they're real people too. So, yeah, they've you, signed you up connect. to, to yeah. save you. Exactly. Um, just to backtrack, you heart failure. That was yep. what was going on. Where did the lungs come into play? The lungs, it was almost out of the blue. They were like, you're likely going to need your lungs transplanted as well. <laughs> it's pretty much everything. They're just going like, to cut take your it head off take and it put it on another yeah. body. They call it the block. So it's like the heart and the lung block. So they literally take out half your organs. That was pretty scary. That was a moment where I, I was like, shit, like, this is getting really fucking complicated. I need to get myself in a, a really positive mind frame because this could quite quickly go wrong and I need to do everything I can within my power to just like keep positive. Mental strength is so important when you're going through like this sort of scenario. When I was told I'd need the heart and lungs, it almost just like elevated it for myself mentally. I was like, all right, cool, let's fucking do this. I'm just going to take this head on. I'm going to do everything I can. I'm going to exercise as much as I can, do whatever the doctors say, basically just try and beat this. So I sort of had this mind frame where I was just like, man, I'm not going to die from this. Like I've fucking got this. Like I'm going to get this transplant. It's all good. And then as you go through two, three, four, five months, it's hard to think that way. And I think during that whole time, there was only a couple of days where I did let it get to me and I was like, I'm going to fucking die. I'm not going to get the transplant. Fuck this, fuck the world. Why am I getting, like, why is this happening to me? Like all that sort of shit. Just the frustration of the whole thing. Exactly. And you're, you're so sleep deprived because you're getting observations every hour. You can't sleep. During the day, it's like test after test after test. There's a lot playing with your, your mind. And I just kind of had to keep that mindset positive because if I didn't, shit would have fallen apart. And, you know, like I had such amazing friends and family that all just were there for me. So it almost became a bit of a like, I'm doing it for them. They're supporting me. I need to fucking get through this. My wife was there every morning, every afternoon, every day, stopped her life completely, dedicated herself to me. And, you know, she was my rock. Like she just like kept me alive. So I think without those people around you, it is fucking hard. For sure. It's pretty crazy, man, because you said before, like, when they first tell you that stuff, like mm. heart transplant, your automatic thing is not good. And that's obviously a defense mechanism. Definitely. We had um, yeah. Aaron on talking about the barley bombings and we yeah. were saying about the, he was paralyzed. And I was like, were you scared that you were paralyzed? He's like, didn't even think about it. Yeah. While there was so much going on, he was like, I'm going to be fine. I'm going to be fine. And yeah. then when the doctor said, you be paralyzed and he's kind of by himself. That's where the negativity starts to come in. Yeah. I think that there is like certain blocks that you put in your brain when like major things happen. And yeah. that's just like part of human nature. Cause yeah. you see it through so many people, you know, this horrible thing now exists that didn't before it brings into play your mortality or the mortality of someone that you care about as much as that buzzword is always like people like you're in denial. Yep. It's like, no, denial is the only thing keeping you sane until you can kind of start to figure out exactly what's going on. Yeah, it's like a survival mechanism. It's a way of just deflecting so you can get through that next day. When you have to truly deal with it, you have to change your whole mindset and be like, okay, I've put up a wall. I've blocked it out for as much as I can. Wall's down. Now I need to go through this round. 
and you need to adapt and you need to kind of, you basically just need to take it head on and kind of like work out a way through it. It's interesting though, because it sounds like the way that you found to do that was to make yourself accountable to other people. So then being yeah. that like, it's like my girl, girlfriend at the time, now wife, mm. I need to stay alive for her. And it, it's like your mind sort of looks for a way to go, what do I need is fuel to keep me going. Exactly. Yeah. You, you find, you find a reason, you know, and obviously the reason is for yourself, you want to survive, but when you've got other people in your corner, you've got to do it for them too. It is hard to remain stoic like all the time though. Like you said, you had that few days there where you yeah. just kind of like break down. And I think that's that's normal. That, oh, that sort it's of, totally natural. That yeah. wall of resistance eventually breaks, but it's, a, it's about knowing that it's okay yep. to feel this way. Let's just patch the wall and tomorrow we're going to feel better. Yeah. Uh, it's, not the end of the, it's not the end of the battle when you start feeling like well, you You kind of need to release as well. You know? Hard. I've, I've chatted to a few friends recently that were – quite close during that period and they're like man you were so positive like killing it essentially not you know <laughs> <laughs> you know i was kind of thinking back i remember mentally thinking that way but there definitely was some like suppressed shit that i was like not allowing people to see and then you know from a physical form i did turn away a lot of friends that wanted to see me and stuff like that purely because i didn't fucking recognize myself like i was looking in the mirror and i deteriorated so much like I couldn't walk, couldn't even get off a bed half the time. Like I weighed like low 50s. It was a struggle to look in the mirror and go, I know this person. It was tough because I went I went and visited him. I think it was probably about three weeks before you ended up getting the transplant. Yeah. You only hear the kind of positive sort of side of it. It's like, yeah. like I'd spoke to you and then I'd spoke to Brody and it was like, yeah, you know, he's doing well. Like it's, mm. it's tough, but yep. you're not outlaying what's going on because A, you don't really want to talk about it and B, you you're trying to stay positive yep, within your sure. bubble. It's like the denial is really that you're going to be okay. Yeah. Like that's the thing that's the denial because it's like, you're probably going to fucking die. <laughs> like you need a lung and There's heart a- transplant, which has never been done in Australia before. No, it has. Um, so I found out uh, yesterday, actually I was at the hospital and I got like a little like medallion type thing. So I'm number six heart and lung transplant in history in WA. So mine was heart and lungs, medical terms I'll leave out of it because I'll totally screw it up. The makeup of my heart is opposite, so the chambers are switched, so are the valves as well. And then my organs are also flipped, so when they transplant, there's like your arteries and stuff that they need to reconnect. And I remember having the meeting with Rob, the surgeon, and it was just like, it's just a bit of plumbing. It's all good. <laughs> and I'm like, cool, man. Like, you got this. Like, and he was super confident. It was kind of like pretty rare, my my situation. Yeah. Without going into the science, I suppose, we, we did kind of brush over it before, the the reason for the lungs. Is there a reason? Like what, was it because of the, the pneumonia, it just fucked your lungs? Or was there no, a, so what was the tie-in? My lungs were actually totally fine. So I was doing like lung tests, all that sort of stuff prior. They were good. Like I've always had really good lungs. But what the risk was, was if they just transplanted the heart, basically the lungs might not calibrate so there's kind of like a gradient that it works on they had to do the heart and the lungs yeah okay. together. yeah and does the otherwise heart, it would be rejected yeah possibly does yeah. that come from the same donor same donor yes. okay yeah okay so like you were saying with the block so the heart and the lungs work in kind of almost close unison so it's yeah. better to replace the whole thing rather the than block, trying to pull yeah. one mm-hmm. Yeah. You're thinking about cars. Uh, yeah. so yeah. you know, like, I was about to say a I'm like, so you got like, a blown head. Yeah. <laughs> it's too much, it's too much pull it off the, ra- it. the radiator's all good. <laughs> the box had to come out. We'll just replace everything. Fuck it, make it new. <laughs> now nah, it makes sense to me. Yeah, but yeah before, because I went in and saw him, like I said, we were expecting to go in and see our friend in hospital, which in my head is just Dwight in hospital. <laughs> yeah. In bed, just chilling. I'm like, hey, man, what's going on? I got in there and it was super confronting because you were a skeleton. Like, what do you yeah. weigh now? Like 80? 75-ish. So and I dropped about 30 plus kilos. Completely gray. Dude, I was like yellow. I like missed Burns. Yeah, yeah, just a total and just a stare. Like, you were fucking pretty much gone. Like you said, you'd probably turn people away. But like, I think people that know you probably don't know. You couldn't really keep up with conversation. Like you were just, the, you were so weak. Dude, I was so fatigued, so sleep deprived, pumped full of tons of meds, couldn't walk. So I was just, my muscle was just getting stripped off and basically just 
lying in a bed dying. Like it was pretty confronting. I mean, it was confronting from me looking in the mirror and then the idea of my close friends seeing me that way, I was like, fuck, I don't want them to like see me dying, you know, because that's like a whole other conversation as well. It's like the effect that it has on the people close to you, you know. So, but, you know, my friends were just like, nah, got to see you you know, show support, show you that you've got people around you, people that love you, people that are in your corner. And, you know, that that was amazing. That, like, kept me going. So I think the craziest part of the story is from there, you were basically waiting yeah. for a heart and lung transplant. So I'd gone through the workup, which consists of a bunch of tests. It's like lung tests, heart tests, blood tests, blah, blah, blah. Then there's the psych test. So I guess, like, if you think about it there, investing a couple of million dollars to do this transplant they want to make sure you're not going to fuck it up basically so you know they do these psych tests to make sure you're not going to go and smoke meth the day after you get a transplant basically and just not fuck up your body after you've just been like given this amazing you know life-saving surgery so <laughs> that's a te- that's a fucking test no shit it's like if you fail this we're not going to allow <laughs> you to live <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty insane. gatekeepers. It sounds like people will be wearing like cloaks. <laughs> it was actually pretty good. Like the guy that did it, I think he did about three psych evaluations. And I was like, man, if I fucking get this surgery, like I'm going to do whatever I can to be as healthy as possible and live my best life. And because that's what you, you think, you literally think that you're like, man, I'm giving a fucking second chance. Like I'm not going to fuck this up. Yeah. So you've got that on your side, but then it's also like, you want to be honest and you want to show honesty because you you are being honest. So, you know, it's like they'll go, oh, did you, have you ever smoked before? And you're like, yeah, when I was like 26 and the manor fucking, you know, <laughs> caught you up, like, of course. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, cool. Like, we're not going to hold that against you. Yeah. That's not what we're doing here. But it's more just making sure you're mentally stable and that you can mentally cope with, I guess, like the trauma and the scenario you're going through. So, yeah, they do that. Then you get placed on the transplant list. It, it varies. It fluctuates. So I was really fucking sick. So I was like right at the top of that list. And then it comes down to a match. It's not a one size fits all kind of vibe. It's like you've got to have kind of like a hundred point check, basically. Like all these things need to match up perfectly in order for that donor to be the right match for you. Sometimes you can be waiting a week. Sometimes you can be waiting five years. You have no idea when it's going to happen which is pretty scary you know the thoughts start to kind of trickle in about in my situation i was deteriorating more and more every day and no sight of when i was going to get this transplant so i was getting pretty fucking worried it got to the point where i just wasn't sleeping yeah could barely get out of bed you know if i walked to the next room down the corridor that was a good day but you're just so mentally and physically depleted. Like it's hard to even think straight. And I kind of like begged the doctors to let me home to have some sleep. They were like well and truly against it because they can't monitor you. They don't know what's going to happen. And I was just like, I need some, I need some fucking sleep. Like I'm going to just like, this is not good. Like, so let me home for a couple of days over the weekend. I think they called it like weekend rest or some shit like that. And then, yeah, basically went home. And I think it was the second day I was home and, you know, finally got a good night's sleep in my own bed. When you're in your comfort zone, you kind of just you start to relax a little bit. I think because I wasn't getting stabbed with needles five times a day and x-rays and lungs pierced and all this sort of stuff, like I kind of got a chance to finally relax. I was actually going back into the hospital that day for, I think it was a checkup because I was going back daily. I think that was part of the deal. And like I had to shower with a, you know, like a chair in the shower because I couldn't stand and stuff. And I basically like almost passed out, kind of made it back to the room and then basically like passed out on the bed. And then my, my wife's mum's neighbor, she was actually downstairs because she was driving me to the hospital because I think Brody was, you know, tied up that day or something. And so she just put her hand up and was like, oh, I'll take you. And I was like, amazing. And so we had to yeah, rush back to the hospital and then, and that's where it really started to sink in that I didn't have much time left and I didn't know 
if I was going to make it. You know, up until that point, I hadn't done a wheel and all that sort of stuff. I just pushed it away. I was like, no, nah, don't want to deal with that. And that was kind of like the first time where I was like, oh, fuck, like this, this is pretty serious. Basically, they, they gave me this drug that it's, it's kind of like what the analogy the, the doctor used. It's like, it's like flogging a dead horse. It's almost like as if it's like adrenaline. So you sort of feel pumped up. Your blood's flowing through your heart. It's going to your body. I felt the best I'd felt in like three or four months. And I was like, man, I don't even need a head tra- transplant. Like I'm all good. But this was literally the last thing they, they could do. It was fucking close. Without that, it was just all going to shut down. There was nothing left to do, yeah. So it was like um, Pulp Fiction. You know, they've stabbed the... <laughs> Epi- EpiPen. Yeah. Yeah. Epi-pen. Yeah. They've just jabbed Shot you with adrenaline, adrenaline yeah. to the That's heart. what it felt like. I was so fatigued and then all of a sudden I had this energy. And you hadn't had energy for ages. It was quite surreal. How yeah. long did it last for? Well, so this is what's crazy. So I was literally fucking close to close my eyes forever. Got that the next morning, similar to your kind of scenario, Josh, you're like, you're very regimented in what happens for your mm. routine. So it's wake up at 5 a.m., weigh, do bloods, breakfast, team comes in, nurse come in. Like it's very regimented. So that scenario happened like normal, except one of the doctors, the head doctors, came in early, and I was like, "What's happening? Like, this is twigs with this you. is weird, yeah. man." Like I thought it was a bad thing. Like I was like, "Fuck!" Yeah, like they're going to tell me about like twenty four hours or something. Mm-hmm. And she comes in, she's like, "Oh, you know, like weather's nice. You know, traffic sucked this morning. We think we've got a donut." <laughs> Start with that lady. Did, didn't didn't even <laughs> register. Like I was just like, what is happening? Like Brody's next to me. She's like crying. I'm just like crying. I'm just like, did you just say what I think you said? Like, can you repeat that? <clears throat> and I think everybody was aware I was I was on the fucking edge of that cliff. So it couldn't have come in any later. And then this really surreal day just started. And you know, it's kind of like you told that, but you can't tell anyone. You can't text anyone. You can't tell your family. It's all completely secret. They've got to do all this workup testing um, just to basically make sure there's compatibility. There's not going to be, you know, work out the risk assessment, all that sort of stuff. We essentially sat around for like four hours and we're sort of like slowly getting updates, but still couldn't tell anyone. It's just Brody and I in the room. Was that because of the family of the person that had passed? That as well as you can literally get on the table and get taken off the table. So they don't want to kind of go, yeah, it's all good. And then they stop it. Unless it's a hundred percent go, they'll kind of just just tell you tell you that it could possibly happen. And we'd sort of had these conversations prior. It's like, this is amazing, but I'm just gonna go through the motions and not get too far ahead of myself. Even though it was literally like days end, but you know, it's kind of like, all right, let's just keep positive. It's all going to be good. Like it's going to unfold. We just need to wait and be calm and be relaxed. What's the mood like in that room with you and Brody? Because you've got people rushing in and out, measuring you and doing all that sort of stuff, right? It was kind of weird because for a lot of the time, we're actually alone, scared as fuck, just going like, is this going to happen? It kind of needs to happen. Like what's, <laughs> what's going on? Like it got to about one o'clock in the afternoon. Nurses came bolting in start shaving my chest doctors like come running in and they're like you've got five minutes to call your family shit i haven't even prepared what i'm going to tell them because i mean at this stage like there's still a pretty solid chance you're not going to wake up so yeah there's so many complications that can happen so you got five minutes to call your family and say positive news but i might never speak to you again (laughs) like i guess you don't think of it that way you kind of just go i was like cool it's happening I'm going to fucking get this. I'm already looking forward to the other side and working out a game plan for that. So, and that's kind of like, cool, it's happening. Call my mom, call my dad. To be honest, I can't even remember what those conversations were. Like it was just highly fueled emotion and click your fingers, that time's over and I'm getting rolled down the corridor. And where's Brody? So she was right next to me. And then we kind of get rolled to theatre with three nurses. And that was sort of like the barrier. Like she had to stop (laughs) kind of like halfway down the hallway we kind of had to say our goodbyes then and they gave you a moment yeah so the nurses kind of turned around in the corridor in this little like semicircle 
and they're like crying. We're like crying. You know, we sort of said like, we'll see you on the other side type, type thing, like I love you and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then into theatre. There's 20, 25 people in the room just like frantically getting shit ready. I lay on this like, I can still feel the chill down my spine, this like freezing cold metal bed that's 30 centimetres wide. It seems cruel, eh? I've had Heat surgery. It up, it's like, like, come on. It's like, yo, give me a fucking mattress. Like, exactly, yeah. It's like, can you make this any more uncomfortable? <laughs> Fuck. And then, you know, before you know it, you've got like needles in every arm, blood pressure getting taken, like this, that, that, oxygen. It's all fucking happening. And I'm like, cool, let's go, like chatting to the docs. Like, I think there was a few jokes running around and stuff. All right, countdown from 100. And I fucking, I swear I got down to like 50 or something. Like, I was just like, is this shit even on? Like, <laughs> I'm like, I want to get this going already. And then it all just kicks off. And then it's like you cross worlds into this. You don't know how much time has passed, but I think it was about three days later that I, I woke up. <laughs> And I was kind of like slowly brought back into consciousness. And man, there's like tubes down your throat. I had like five tubes in my stomach. I, th I think I might've showed you a photo, but yeah. like wires everywhere, like machines all around the bed. It was just absolutely crazy. And what had happened was, because you're kind of drifting in and out of consciousness, the nurses in the rooms were having conversations and I'd picked up these little snippets of information from different conversations and piece this narrative in my head that I think it was like I was getting flown to New Zealand, <laughs> the organs were coming from Adelaide and I hadn't had the transplant. Like something had happened, they had pulled me out. Yeah, and it's really funny because in my head, basically I was freaking out because I hadn't had this transplant and I was getting slowly, and actually Brody was telling me just before this, but basically they were... They thought I was still unconscious and they were talking in the room and one of the nurses said to Brody, you should talk to him. Like, And then as she said that, I had squeezed her hand and then she was like, can you hear me? And I squeezed her hand again and like, that's when they kind of knew to start that I was okay and they mm. could start to bring me back into consciousness. And then once that happened, once I was kind of, I guess awake enough to not articulate what I was doing because I was fucking high as a kite. But like I was trying to say, I was trying to sign language. I can't sign. Like I was like <laughs> doing some shit. I don't know what I was trying to do. And then I was like, give me a pen and paper. Because at this point I'm freaking out. I think I haven't had the transplant. Like I think I'm going to fucking New Zealand. Like I don't know what's happening. <laughs> You're just high as shit and you're just picking up tiny bits of information. <laughs> yeah, and you can't talk. You got a, you got oxygen tube down your throat you got tubes all through your stomach you're essentially like chained to a bed so i sort of wrote on this paper after about i don't know a day of squiggling shit have i had the transplant and brody i found only found this out today as well she started crying she had realized that i'd been sitting there for like two days not knowing i was freaking out and she was like yeah you've had it and then i kind of like looked down and a like there's this giant scar. <laughs> like yeah. it's like, Fucking hell. It's so crazy, man, because people assume that everyone's timelines move at the same speed. Yeah. There's the yeah. same thing again. We were talking last week with Aaron. The first thing he said when he got out of surgery was like, what fucking happened? Yeah, exactly. And no one realized that he didn't know a bomb had gone off. He'd just been going yeah. through all this stuff. And it was, as far as he's concerned, everything was fine. Yeah. And now I'm here. All this crazy stuff's gone on. Yeah. And for you, it's like you've come out and obviously your lucid mind is going all yeah. over the place and everything's kind of like a dream state. So yeah. it'd be hard to differentiate what's reality and what isn't. Definitely. And then, you know, you kind of day after day, they sort of remove the tubes. I always had like wires connected to my heart. So I had to like literally rip those out of my chest. Um I always had a, a defib machine like taken out during that surgery as well. So I got a kind of like massive scar down my, my rib cage. And you kind of like start to come back into consciousness and then you sort of start to work out what's happening. And then it's like flick the switch. You need to start doing rehab. You need to get out of bed. I swear like they pulled the fucking tubes out, pulled the catheter out, and then it's like start walking. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> wow, Give me a man. fucking minute. I was like... Yo, I'm just, I'm still got this shit cakes to be like. <laughs> Were you in a lot of pain initially as you came out? 
so obviously you, dosed up on drugs. But. Yeah, you, you've got this little button of, I'm not sure what it was, but it was the good stuff. Yeah. I wasn't pushing it. Like you're meant to push it constantly every time you're in, you know, you feel a little bit of pain because you have like your sternum cracked and like all this sort of stuff, scars everywhere, you know, open surgery. So it's brutal. It's painful. Mm. Yeah. Every time you move, you've got to hold a pillow to your chest and you have to move very, very slowly. Mm. And like I was like bleeding and all that sort of stuff. And, but I wasn't pushing this button for some stupid reason. Like mm. I just, I think I just forgot about it. Like, yeah. And then you push it and you get this relief and you're like, oh my God. Like this, <laughs> I could have been doing this the whole time. Yeah. Just hold your finger on it. <laughs> yeah. Hey, can I jump us back just quickly? Yeah. You left Brody in the hallway. Yep. You're getting wheeled in. Yep. You're joking around. You're doing, you still get your guard up somewhat. Like you're still sort yeah. of like, this is fine. Yep. I've been in like a number of surgeries, like shattered my hand and mm. I've had a couple of knee surgeries and gone under. Most of the time when people die in hospitals, it's dying from mistakes with anesthesia. Yep, for sure. And I knew that whether that's true or not, like I'd read that on the internet. So as far as I was concerned, I was like, I, I might close my eyes right now on yeah. that on that exact <clears throat> thing that you're talking about yep. and not wake up again. There's this panic when you're doing the count down backwards. Yeah. And you're like, is this the last thing I'm going to see? Yeah. And like, this is non-life threat. This is just fucking surgery. It's like just going 63 under. is the last thing you say. I suppose potentially everything that was happening so fast yep. and you were already so mentally depleted and mm. out of it somewhat and you've had that adrenaline you've had an absolutely insane sort of 12 24 hours does that cross your mind at all i mean i knew it was a possibility but in the context it was the lowest possibility i guess it's definitely been on my mind post that when i have gone under it for other tests where it's more isolated i feel like that's where it has been more kind of amplified for me but at that specific time i was just like let's fucking do it well you was, were you knew you were probably days away from dying anyway well yeah that's the thing i, I knew i didn't have much left so it was like i'll do whatever well <laughs> <laughs> this is the best case scenario yeah, yeah, right yeah. now this yeah. is the best option i have exactly so it was kind of just like let's get it done i think when i went in there i was kind of pretty pumped because like it's finally happening how long were you officially on the waiting list for a donor it wasn't actually very long um, because you kind of get bumped depending on how sick you are and, you know, a million other things. But I was very high on that list um, nationally. So I think it was about three and a half months, but it's the lottery. Like you don't know, mm. like you, like there's people that have had heart transplants and been on the list for two days. Other times, you know, I speak to a lot of the crew, the younger crew in the clinic and stuff and, there's people that have been waiting for every year. But and you wouldn't have lasted more than a week. I don't know how long I would have lasted, but I knew there wasn't much in the tank. After the transplant occurred and to, to now really, has there been any stage during this process that you've had or like a weird feeling? So like um, having someone else's organs put inside you. Yeah. Is it something you're conscious of? Like I, I think of the analogy of like getting a – like a splinter, like you know yeah. there's something foreign in there even though you might not be able to see it. Is, yeah. is, is that? I mean, it can't miraculously play the piano or anything. No. Uh, <laughs> I, was, I thought you, before you were going to say like I just started doing sign language and it turned out that the, the, the donor was like yeah. deaf. <laughs> I sort of find through talking to other transplantees that it's a really hard situation to broach, right, because – it's such a, a tragic situation has happened in order for me to survive so and be given a second chance. So I found it quite hard to put a connection to a person, I guess. I look at it like I need to honour these organs and honour that person, even though I don't know who that is. But I need to do everything within my power to kind of, yeah, just make sure I like honour that person mm. because, you know, something's tragic has happened. In terms of like how the organs physically feel, like I remember going for my first run post-transplant and my organs were just fucking bouncing around everywhere. Oh, you could feel them. Yeah, because they're obviously like different sizes to my mm. organs. And I remember the, the team kind of going like, you'll adapt, it'll find its place and my heart sort of sits not in a normal position. Right. So when I lay on my left-hand side, I can feel my heart beating through my rib cage. So when I was running, shit was bouncing everywhere and I was, I was freaking out because I'm like, am I going to bruise my organs? Like, is this bad? What What is, you know, because you just don't know. Just going to twist it up or. Well, that's you know? it. Yeah. And then, so I talked to the docs and they were like, no, no, it's cool. Like, you know, you won't cause any issues. It'll find its place and it'll 
you know, tissue and fat and stuff will grow around it, but it feels weird and I don't like running. Mm. So it's my excuse not to. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. so crazy though. I don't know what, exactly what the, whether it's the laws or, or what the, the ethics thing are. You can't find out. Basically, you're not told anything. There has been situations where there's been like extortion involved and all that sort of stuff with families of the donor and the receiver. And I think quite a few years back, they implemented a, a rule where basically the donor, you, you don't know. Fully anonymous. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So you might know if it's male or female or, you know, stuff like that, like very, very minuscule facts. Which is probably the right way to do it, but it kind of eliminates the potential for those kind of heartwarming TikToks, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Probably <laughs> Will Smith movies. Transplantee yeah. meets the transplanters. Uh, but you want to know as well. Like I remember mm. when I woke up, I was like, I had questions and I was like, I wanted to know, was that person fit, for instance? Because True. Like practical questions. Yeah. like Was he a smoker? Um, exactly. Yeah. Like those type of questions. How old was, was he, you know, like, and they can't tell you. Once you kind of get over that, I started to look at it like, all right, I'm not going to attach this to a person because I don't know who that person is. I'll attach it to an honor system type thing where I will honor that person because I'm alive because of them. Mm -hmm. A lot of different receivers feel completely different. Like they feel attached to the organs or call them specific names or more of a say, I guess, a personal attachment to them. And everyone's different. It is quite a surreal thing to kind of sort of unpack I don't even know how to really make sense of it in my own brain. <laughs> yeah. Do you know, was it a guy or a girl? Or? I do know it was a guy. And I do know they were younger than me. Um, that's pretty much all I know. Mm. And what's been life like for you post that? I mean, yeah. it's probably a big, big apple to bite into. But. Big change. Um, yeah, I guess kind of pulling it back to sort of waking up. Then, you know, it goes to pulling out all the tubes, all that sort of stuff walking you know i think the first day it was like walk three steps walk five steps walk to the next door um and you know i see you as a a pretty confronting place like it's it's somewhere you don't want to spend a lot of time because you're literally in a, a hallway with the like sickest or the the worst you know situations possible so you kind of you kind of want to get out of there as soon as possible and start rehab and just start being positive and kind of moving towards something good started walking um then got moved wards um and then basically it's just rehab so it's like all right stand up three times stand up 10 times you know and every day is a little bit more and i had this um you know kind of hit list from the physio so you're working with like all these different people as well your heart team your lung team your physio team um so there's all this support around you it's kind of the onus is on you to really like fucking make it happen so i was like all right cool like got a second chance let's let's fucking kick this off so i was like walk 10 meters so i'd walk 30 meters and just do all those things so i just you know i'd I'd 100 plus everything you're only benefiting yourself so whatever you put in you get out so i just kind of took that mentality you can kind of stay in hospital for a month three months six months whatever i was pretty determined to get out by my birthday which was about a month later so I kind of just, yeah, hit the physio hard, kind of like started building muscle, started getting back mentally, physically started building my body again. I was like, man, there wasn't much left. Like I was literally had to walk again, learn to walk again. Couldn't take showers for I think three weeks without support. It's the 1%, you know, it's like doing a little bit more every day. And then all of a sudden a month later, you look back on those photos and you're like, oh shit, like that's I've come up a, a really long way. But when you're looking in the mirror every day, you don't you don't notice those small changes. And then yeah, basically just try to get back into normality. You've kind of got marker points, like it's year one, year two, year three, year five. Year one, year two, with my situation, you've still got a really big chance of rejection. So there is a still a really solid chance she could go wrong and you don't make it. There is still that, but at the same time, I was like back in hospital constantly, two, three weeks at a time, all throughout those first two, three years, because from anything from food poisoning to infections to- a Common you know, cold could have sent you on a spiral. Yeah. yeah. So, well, the thing is you've, you're, you're immunocompromised. So 
you've essentially got no immune system. So all of a sudden you, you need to completely be aware of if somebody's sick, you've got to leave the room. If you can't go into public spaces, you can't do this, you can't touch that wall, you can't touch this rail at a train station. Like you need to be really, really on all of that sort of stuff. In a weird way, COVID hitting at that time it did, in a weird way it made my life a lot easier because everyone was a lot more conscious of being sick and not passing it on. It sort of decreased my chance of getting sick because I was working from home a lot. I wasn't seeing a lot of people. If I was, it was sort of at a distance. Um, so although it was you know, kind of lonely as fuck at times, but it, it probably did help in sort of year three and four of me kind of getting into like a routine of being healthy. It was pretty hard because you kind of go to the gym, you build up this muscle, you're feeling good, you're feeling fit. Like, you know, you're also on a shitload of medications which have all of these side effects. So you're kind of like trying to find this balancing act. You finally get it to where you're starting to feel somewhat normal and then you get an infection and you're in hospital for three weeks and you start again. All that muscle is depleted. You're back to square one. You start again mentally and physically. And that kind of happened quite a lot. It is hard, but you just got to you got to remain positive and you mm. just got to push through and you just got to go, all right, cool, set back again, but let's do it again. I know I know if I do this, then this happened. I think it's been like two years now and I've had one cold. So, yeah, right. In which is just, in the pudding. it's just crazy. Like, you know, comparing those first two, three years where I was back in hospital constantly and now working out heaps, eating really well, super positive, got a good mindset, physically really active. And I feel like I've kind of just, I sort of use this analogy a bit, like I've crawled out of a like a dark tunnel and like a little bit of light sort of starting to shine on me and I'm like getting out of it and mm. finding that normality again. And I was kind of down south a, a few weeks ago. And so another thing you need to watch out for is um, basically cancer. So you've got a really high risk of now getting skin cancer because of the immunosuppressants and all the other meds and stuff. So I basically stay out of the sun, don't swim anymore, all that sort of stuff. And I was down south a few weeks ago and I hadn't been in the ocean since pre-transplant. Brody was just like, just jump in, like get in there. And then so I did and it was like this biblical moment, like washing these like the last five years off me. It was almost like a baptism moment. And it was kind of like I just shedded myself of all this shit that had happened and I was allowing myself to kind of move forward. And I sort of feel like the last five years have just been in a bit of a daze. You just, you're in survival mode. So you're just trying to survive day by day and then this happens, you get pulled back and you're like, all right, got to be positive again, do this, do this. If anybody from the outside looking in, they probably wouldn't know that at all. They'd be like, man, you're doing great. Like this is so like in my head, I'm like, there's all these side effects as this, 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 this. And like, yeah, for the first time I sort of felt like, fuck, I need to really start living properly in the moment. So I think realizing those things are like a big sort of step forward to getting back to who I was, I guess. That motivation and kind of drive is hard to maintain as well though. Definitely. You touched on, um, like the concept of second chances yeah and it's and it's one that i sort of can can relate to in in some way having gone through what i went through if i'm honest with you that seems really important at the time and then you find yourself sometimes often sometimes not maybe slipping back into old routines yeah, where you, you sure. can forget the slip into that complacency is that complacency something that you've you've noticed yourself and you sometimes forget yeah, the it's, promises you made potentially along the way. Man, totally. It's yeah. like I need to fucking get it tattooed on me mm. because, you know, you're trying so hard to get back to normality. But at the same time, you've been given this second chance. So you kind of subconsciously telling yourself, man, until I do this and do this and do this and like really live my life the I way need to be I should. Normality. Exactly. And then the everyday happens and you live. And you do the same shit everybody else does and you go to work, you cook dinner, you watch fucking Tiger King or whatever and you go to bed and then it's repeated. So I really need to check myself 
and give advice to myself. And that's something that I'm conscious of, but I need to do a lot more of. I mean, at the same time, you can't put too much pressure on yourself because the thing that we were talking about a while ago was you were a normal person living a normal life. You're 31 years old. You got plans. You're trying to figure out exactly what you're doing. You know, you've got, you were putting on art shows like the the iHeart thing and Mm -hmm. Mm. was involved with fucking Dan Aykroyd and stuff. And like, (laughs) it was someone that I knew really well and was constantly doing things. He was like trying to express himself and trying to build businesses. And then that gets taken away from you. And then it's like five Dude. years is just get through today, just get through today, just get through today. Yeah. And then you come to a point where you're like, okay, well, physically I'm now okay. My body has accepted these organs Yeah. and you can live every day without fear of this terminal issue. Yeah. But five years has gone by and the world's different and you're different. Mm. and I've said this more than once on here, but when something major happens in your life, and for me it was losing my dad to cancer and the carry-on effects that that had for me, you keep thinking when are things going to return to normal and you're like, like, no, there's you need a new normal now. You need to accept that. You can build now what it is that you want, but you're never going to get the momentum or the happiness or the carefreeness or the, the best word for it will probably be the ignorance of what your life was then. Yeah, for because sure. Because you probably see yourself at 25 and be like, oh man, it's killing you, have no, you have no idea how lucky you are right Dude, now. and I think that's, that's like some of the stuff that I battle with internally. It's like the memory of myself pre-transplant was, you know, kind of all the things you, you mentioned, like I was super energetic, doing all this stuff. Like, you know, I felt like I was a dude that, did a lot of stuff and was like really kind of happy with my life and all that sort of stuff. You want to get back to that. But the reality of it is you're a different person. You've gone through this giant trauma and life-changing experience and I'm also not 25. For me, it sort of feels like I've been in this weird dream for five years and it's like trying to, to get back to that person I was when I was 30. But now it's like reevaluating and working out, well, What's important? Health, good people. Like you add a few things, you know, a few more things on, and it's like you got a different perspective on life. So, yeah, I think that thirty-year-old you know, Dwight didn't stop existing. Um, he's still, it's still there. It still yeah. forms the foundation of who you are. But for, I think, um, you know, your example, uh, the sickness and the transplant almost puts like a, a full stop at the end of that sentence, mm. and then we take on, you know what remains of Dwight here into the new Dwight and what's important now moving forward. V2. Exactly. But (laughs) the thing that I was saying is it's sometimes hard to keep yourself aligned with those goals all the time. And I think it's easy to feel guilty when you don't. Yeah. But I think it's important to know that it's fine not to, to, to feel like you've fucked it up or, Mm. or you're not doing what you promised yourself because at least you're identifying it. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. And then make moves to adjust and, and move forward. Yeah. But it's it's not going to be smooth sailing. I think some people might have the opinion that, you know, you come out of something, you set a new a goal and I'm going to be a different person and off you go and do it. It's, yep. it's a lot bumpier than that. Definitely. You're viewing everything through a new lens. I mean, if you hadn't gone through that, 37-year-old Dwight was never going to be the same person as 32-year-old Dwight. That's it, yeah. You're going to have five years of life experience in there no matter what and yep. your perspective is always going to change because if you think about who you were at 25 versus who you were at 20. It's a long time, yeah. It's a long time. hundred. And you, you, know, you mature so much in five years. You experience so many different things in five years. You know, It shapes and evolves the person you are. As long as you're aware that you have been given a second chance, then that's good you do the best you can. Mm. It means you're grounded. That's your sort of compass. Because I think if you're in denial of that, and as you said, like you're doing psych evaluations and stuff like that, Mm. this is a pretty major thing to go through like mentally. So the capacity for you to kind of fly off the rails on the other side of it, yeah, you know, there's like survivor's guilt and like a a whole ton of different things. It's interesting you said before about like, you know, you become more mature and you're viewing things as a more mature person. Mm because you've gone through these experiences. But I think something I noticed as getting older, and I spoke to a few friends about this, is you think it's kind of a choice. You think that you're going to be like, I'm just going to get my shit together. I'm going to be more mature now. Yeah, but it's not. It just, it starts to happen and your mind starts to think differently. Yeah. And you start to make more mature 
decisions, decisions and yeah. that shows itself as just being a more fucking boring person sometimes and you're like oh man i wish i wasn't this way i wish i was still this but it's just something that serves you better in your mind things differently and you, mm. you get enjoyment out of things that you wouldn't have got enjoyment out of yeah, before sure. and you and you let those other sort of probably more turbulent things go so yeah i think this has happened to you at a point in life where people are having that journey of maturing and, and sort of recalibrating and going from being you know you were going out partying yeah exactly out and about and stuff yep. that was going to end anyway yeah yeah hopefully. but you didn't yeah. have a chance yeah you didn't have a chance to make that choice that choice was made for you in a weird way, I was kind of getting a bit done with that whole sort of partying sort of vibe. And I was sort of like, I was like, man, I don't want to go out to fucking 3 a.m., three nights in a row again. Like, I'm just, I'm done with it, you know. I, was, I think I was sort of like starting to slow down, but pretty much like a like you guys, you know, just normal, normal dude. So we are fucked. <laughs> <laughs> if we are your basis for normal then you yeah. you, you need right. to recalibrate I'll, I'll freeze that I'll rephrase that one <laughs> i can i consider myself like a pretty regular guy um yeah definitely didn't sort of sit down when i was 21 and you know write in my diary like at 30 years old i'll get a heart and lung transplant like that's not what i expected at all so it's been a pretty crazy journey and life's a motherfucker. I mean, Josh spoke about the first time we started this, like life has this way of shifting your fucking focus or mm. shifting your alignment or changing your perspective or taking you on a journey that you don't want to go on. Because I think up until, you know, if you're, if you're fortunate and, and we've been fortunate, I think everyone here has been fortunate for the most part, like you get to do your like teenage years and then your 20s. Mm completely on your own compass like you're just picking what you want to do and just following yeah. past and go oh, fuck i don't want to do that anymore i'm going to move down i'm going to try this and then you get to that point it's funny because when you were just before you got locked up in japan like you were saying i'm going to try and kind of get my shit together after this i realized that this is probably the end of a chapter and mm. this is kind of my final last hurrah and life was just like boom and just Curb stomp you. The thing that I'm starting to like really believe in is that along the way, and I had plenty in my late teens, early 20s, life dishes you out a bunch of warnings along the way. Yeah. And it's on you to take heed. If you don't take heed, life eventually slaps you with that giant speeding fine. Mm. And for me, that was that was my speeding fine. And then it's up to you to kind of take take notice or not. It's not punishment though, is it? It's no. just it's just life going, eh, regardless of what you want to do, this is what's happening. Exactly. Yeah. But adjust. Yeah, you have an oar on that river, but at the end of the day, the current is going one way and you can only navigate the way that that current's taking you. Exactly. And for you, it was just like... Oh, dude, I, I definitely had some red flags. Like, <clears throat> I mean, for me, like looking back at my 20s, I definitely should have been more well-versed in my condition and what was actually happening internally. And then obviously when I first started getting sick, I should have taken that a lot more serious um, and not tried to do the, you know, macho man, tough guy type thing, which a lot of a lot of guys do, unfortunately. The and invincibility it's, play. Like. Exactly. And it's not until something serious happens that you just go, who was I doing that for? Mm. Like, what was the point of that? And, you know, like I wish I saw those red flags and was like, hey, I'll go and see my cardiologist or I'll go and do this because – who knows? It might have been different, you know? Um, I think you were living in denial of that existing because it's reinforcing constantly that you are okay and that you don't need to worry about that. Yeah, yeah. And you believe it. Yeah. And then on the you're sitting in a hospital Going, waiting for a nah, transplant. You're nah, like, that's all oh, good. I was so wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, I was, I was literally still in denial until I was getting told to go up to my room in the hospital. Mm. And I was like, shit. All right, this is real. <laughs> Did you yeah. lose your temper? Did you lose your temper in there at all? Because I lost my temper in the oh. hospital once after surgery. Um, I'll tell a story because it's 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 way less intense than any other story. <laughs> cool it down. A I bit. just had a um, knee reek on on a ward, you know, like because I, I didn't have private cover, so I didn't have mm. my own room or anything. And um, you know when you know someone hates you, <laughs> and it doesn't happen that often, but you know you meet someone and you're just like, oh. Yeah. Did I <laughs> just the aura? Did I like do, stabbing do something to you? The nurse came in and she hated me. So I'm like coming out of operative drugs. Mm. I'm a bit confused. My mom's there, my girlfriend at the time. I'm like 25. 
another nurse comes in like a more senior one and she is as well and i'm like well i wonder what's happened here and then i found out later that i'd been strapped to the bed afterwards i didn't know but I was, i'm allergic to morphine so i get really Fuck. itchy yeah so like apparently i was just being a pain in the ass like wriggling around scratching like, around yeah. yeah so they come in and they say have you been to the toilet yet and i'm like i've literally just woke up i have no idea and so they just come over put an ultrasound on my stomach and she's like your bladder's full you need to go to the toilet i'm like completely incapacitated and um she's just standing there and she hands me a bottle that looks like a um pilot's mask so i'm just like okay well there's my mom my girlfriend oh dude i had to do that so many times yeah Mm. like and then they're just standing there as if you're like just meant to start pissing in front of people while sitting down on a hospital bed it's this most unnatural yeah. thing ever i kind of got comfortable with it <laughs> weirdly <laughs> and they said to me they, they threatened me they were like if you can't do it we're putting a catheter Ooh. in and that's yeah. when i was the a, worst word i was threatened with a forced mm-hmm. catheter mm-hmm. yeah and i just threw the thing and like we i was like well, this is bullshit <laughs> and had the full freak out and i put it down to just have post-operative drugs and stuff i'm confused mm. and i'm confused turns into anger or aggression especially when you're younger did you have any points in there where you were just like fuck this i don't want to play this game right now there's probably like two points that spring to mind which was like one i had my lungs drained through the back of my ribs so imagine getting stabbed really slowly with so basically i couldn't have painkillers or like a very small dose because it was going to interact with all the other shit i was on they're like oh yeah 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 it's we just need to drain your lungs like it's a really small procedure like it's going to be all good and then these guys like come into the room and i had to sit on the end of the bed and it was like they like dudes holding me down and i'm like this is weird. <laughs> it's not starting well <laughs> and i was like this is not what i expect <laughs> and they shove a rod through your back into your lungs and drain your lungs and then i had to have that for like three days so i've kind of got like this bullet wound on my back um that was quite frustrating because I was like, this hurt a lot more than I was fucking expecting. Another time was, um, you know, I was getting bloods multiple times a day um, and they were putting in a... Um, it's like a, can- a cannula? Cannula, yeah. yeah. And this guy, poor dude, like if, there's like this these stats basically, if you don't get it the first time, it drops by 50%, mm. third time, another 50%. And it just it like gets three times. Diminishing and like, returns. <laughs> like I think you get to two, fucking give up. Yeah. And I think this guy had like four or five goes and it was to the point where it was like the needle was in there. It was like a big ass needle and he's like moving it around. Oh. And I'm like, dude, fuck off. Like yeah. you're done. <laughs> <laughs> and like, this a medical student? I think he was yeah. a junior. Yeah. And like, and I was kind of like a little bit of a guinea pig, right? Cause I was, I had this, all this weird shit. So I was always having all these students come in and, you know, like listen to my heart and do this and put in needles and all this sort of stuff. And like, I'm all for it because I'm like, they need to learn. I've had it done a million times, so I don't give a fuck. Like, it's just another, I don't care who does it. But I think this time, it was probably around the time when I was having a couple of shitty days in a row and then my fucking hands full of blood and this dude's just poking a needle around. Mm. I'm just like, all right, fuck off. <laughs> like, this is enough for today. Like, I'm calling it. But majority of the time, I think, I don't know, I think I was a like a, godlike patient like all the nurses love me they always like probably shouldn't say this but like would steal like lemonades out of the fridge and stuff for me and like they're all super super cool because i was just like calm collective positive and just trying to do whatever i could to get through it so i think like not all patients are like that like a lot of them i mean the shit that i heard in the corridors and the you know the rooms next door and stuff like horrific shit and like yeah, they, they have to deal with some shit. Like there's some patients that, you know, like there was one guy next to me that was like I, I felt terrible because he, I think he was just hallucinating. I'm not sure what happened, but basically he thought everyone was a spy and he wouldn't trust anyone and he like smashed a screen and stabbed a nurse with a spoon. And, you know, I'm just like laying there like listening to all this unfold in the corridor and security coming and, you know, so like so much shit happens and yeah, I mean, in comparison to a lot of, a lot of patients, I think I was relatively pretty, pretty good. 
hearing about um, Jason Bourne in the room next to you, like <laughs> you were, you were telling me <laughs> about hallucinations. Uh, I do, and that was yeah. the fucking wildest thing I've ever heard. I was told pre-transplant, you may hallucinate. You know, have fun with that. <laughs> and I'm like sitting there. I think I'd just gone back to the ward. I'd like, I think I still had. I'm not sure if it was morphine hitting that or whatever, but. Man, there was like flaming demons in the corner. There was like fucking scorpions like running up the roof around me. There was giant tarantulas like on my fucking bed like crawling over me. And I was just like, this is cool. Like <laughs> what else can I fucking imagine? Like I was actually pumped by it because, I, you know, a pretty creative dude. I was just like, what else can happen? I'm pretty fucking So wild. you were aware that it wasn't real? Yeah, I was because I'd been pre-warned. It was pretty surreal it's like watching a horror movie for your own eyes you know like mm. it's, it's right in front of you but it's not really there it's like it's this weird trick and like usually the devils were like la- the devil was, devil just was like at laughing you, at me yeah just like s- fucking flaming in the corner like pointing and laughing that's weird. kind of ominous considering yeah. where you were <laughs> yeah it was weirdly sitting on like a wooden chair as well which uh, i don't know why i, remember I love that, that you remember that yeah <laughs> if i had tarantulas walking on me you can fuck that right yeah, off. I would too. just check. I'd be like, you can give these uh, yeah. hard lungs to someone else. Like, <laughs> as long as it wasn't snakes, like I fucking hate snakes. So like <laughs> spiders, cool snakes. I would have been fucking jumping out of there real quick. Jesus. It's been quite an interesting thing because you're obviously kind of the miracle guy because you had the double mm. lung and heart transplant. Yeah. You meet like a bunch of other post transplant people. You've had to go and do speeches and stuff. And yeah, so sort of post-transplant, I did a lot of talks to universities, ICU teams, hospitals, students, like all that sort of stuff, um, which was really nice. Like it's it's nice for me to kind of like give back and tell my story. And, you know, now it's kind of gotten to the point where when they do get younger crew into the clinics, I chat to them. I've spoken to quite a lot of them now. It's something that I wish I had pre-transplant because, you know, you chat to these doctors and they, you know, they give you the medical version of what's going to happen and all that sort of stuff, but you don't know how it's going to affect your life, your relationships, your friends, you know, like everything to fucking, can you go in the sun? Can you eat this? Like it's... It's not a movie. Friends don't just automatically become fantastic. You lose a lot of people, right? Yeah, 100%. Like... It's a really weird situation because everybody reacts differently and everybody has their own way of dealing with that sort of stuff. You know, when you're seeing a friend literally dying in front of you, how do you fucking react? Like it's it's so hard. So through that process, I definitely lost relationships with a lot of friends, not through any kind of like wrongdoing or negativity or what you find is you find out who your true core friends are during that scenario. And it's crazy, man. Like I had people that I barely knew hit me up every two, three days and be like, hey, man, how you doing? Like just checking in. Can, I, can you bring her this? So all of a sudden you realize how many fucking great people there are out there. You tend to focus on them. You know, you always hear these stories like, oh, you want to have five close friends and that's all you need. And it's, it's kind of like sort of rang a bit true because all the people that were there for me, I know are going to be there for me forever. If they're going to be there for me during that time, then they're not going anywhere, you know. And those people I truly value. My family, obviously, Brody was, you know, like they called her fucking Dr. Brody because she just knew absolutely everything with what was going on. Like I was just like half dead in the bed, just not knowing anything. And she's like, "All right, you got. Why are you giving him this med? Like, why is his blood pressure up to one forty two? Like." <laughs> Well, you need to be on and, top of stuff, man, because yeah. the hospitals make mistakes all the time because you get yeah. that many different people coming through. Definitely. And how, the, long, how long have you guys been dating for? Not long. That's what's crazy because we met, really liked each other, and within like a month, we were like going to Europe. And then we did that, and then we are booking a South America trip, and that's when this happened. Um, so we were already living together. It had been like less than a year. We had the talk, and it was like, I could potentially die. Part of me wanted to break it off there and then because I didn't want to bring her through this thing that could potentially kill me. Like how heavy is that for someone to go through that? But yeah, you didn't sign up for this. Exactly. You know, and like we'd only known each other like 11 months or something and and she was like, I'm all in. You know, like she's like, I'll do whatever I need to do. I'm here for you. 
And she was there literally every morning at like six o'clock, every night till nine o'clock, put her whole life on hold, her career on hold. Absolutely amazing woman. And as soon as she made that decision to stay, I was like, well, putting a ring on it. Like, yeah. <laughs> it was just like a no brainer. Like, yeah. you know. When did you propose? So it was, we we're down in Denmark. I think it was about two years afterwards. We went to Tassie about a year afterwards. I thought I was feeling great. Getting back to normality. We went to this trip on Tassie and I didn't kind of realize at the time, but we've spoken about it since. And she was so fucking scared. I couldn't even climb steps. I was sleeping every day because I was still fatigued. I wasn't in good shape at all, but I just pushed because I was like, I need to experience stuff. I need to like start living. I need, I can't now travel to most countries. And that's almost like a way to start living again. Little did I know she was freaking out the entire time because anything could happen. Yeah, you know, like I could, could collapse. Could, exactly. I could yeah. have rejection. I could get sick. We're miles away from hospitals. So the stress that she was under, and like this is all stuff you don't think about anyone else. You're just so involved with your own self in your own head. You've got blinders on, you know. You don't really think about how your situation affects all the people around you physically and mentally. I can't even fathom like sitting there and watching, say, you die. Like I can't even imagine what that feels like. I'm watching someone that you love just deteriorate, deteriorate, go on, fuck, this person's going to die. It's so hard. I think it's taken me a while to kind of realize it's bigger than me, I guess. There is other people involved. I kind of pulled you away from it before, but doing rehab and stuff and you meet mm. other survivors and that. Yeah, basically I speak to the younger people as they're getting worked up. And it's something that I guess I wish I had when I was pre-transplant. You get an insight into what's coming up, what you're facing, how do you face it? You can get tips, all that sort of stuff. I spoke to a couple of people, yeah, even last week, and I feel like it's, it's definitely quite rewarding for them as well as myself because I feel good by helping someone and giving them a bit of insight into not the medical version of what's going to happen and how to react, basically. You probably have a healthy cynicism of what doctors are saying because you're like, yeah. I don't really know. You're obviously trying to keep me upbeat and stuff. Yep. Then they can wheel you in and be like, this is a finished product. This is it's what a, it looks it's like. It's a little bit of that. It's like this guy's five years post. Look how young and fit and healthy he looks. Mm. Whereas, you know, you walk into the clinic, it's bad. People are dying in there. Like they're literally where I was five years ago. To get a glimpse of hope of what's on the other side, I hope that they look at me and go, cool, I can be that person. And I think that's all I want. Yeah, I suppose there's responsibility on you to help people. I'm sure you're here for a reason, like, you know, mm -hmm. you survive for a reason and you you move forward and all that. But at the same time, you're just a normal human being. Yeah. It's had an extraordinary thing. I know I spoke to you a while ago and you said that people you work with, like, found mm -hmm. out about it and were like, what the fuck? Because you don't walk around with a sign on you saying that this all is... All career email. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want it to define who you are well, as a that's person. It, but yeah. I definitely don't want it to define me, even though it's been such a major thing that's happened to me. And it has kind of defined who I am now, but I don't want pity or I don't want any of those things. I want to be somebody that people look at and go, fuck, that guy's had that up and like, he's doing amazing. Like, that's cool. When we sort of do a little bit of transplant week stuff at work and stuff like that, yeah, it's pretty crazy. We've got two transplantees at work, which is just mental. It's like a gauge it's, road, it's like transplantee yeah, program. like a little team. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, back the Gage Rose manager, she only had her kidney transplant six months ago. So for this year's Donate Week, HR sent her out an email talking about Beck and her experience and stuff. And then because we've sort of grown so rapidly, we've got so many new staff that obviously don't know my situation. And then they did a little paragraph on me. It's like, oh, and you might also remember Dwight had a heart lung transplant. And then literally like, every fucking 20 meters in the hallway people are like what the hell man like <laughs> <laughs> i think this is the funniest thing is like everyone that we've had on here in some capacity has had this fucking crazy story to tell but at the end of the day like it just it's all just normal people walking around doing normal things well that's it and people mm. care enough like people listen and like people messages and stuff and it's awesome but it makes you realize that i'm sure if you sit down with anyone for long enough they're going to tell you some story that's going to blow your mind yeah and i mean you know, behind the mask, everyone's got shit going on. So I think we all forget that 
we're all fucking used to looking at the Instagram world and you kind of forget that there's real people out there with real problems and some are big, some are small, but you know, it's I think Instagram has like started like a new thing now though, where it's like we were all completely aware that it's bullshit, mm. but we're also completely aware that it's part of life. Even if you know, even if you see someone doing Instagram things, you're still like, oh, you're good at promoting yourself on Instagram. You're what? not like, oh, your life is amazing. That's now like a new layer of the human psyche is public persona. If somebody is that kind of person that documents their life and tries to look up everything, that is the very best that it can be. Mm. That said, I mean, there is definitely advantages in taking taking a shit ton of photos. And there's a fine line between being a faux influencer and and trying to retain someone. I think it's kind of a little bit sad because, I mean, we've all grown up in f- photographic kind of backgrounds, mm. right? And I think back to my dad and I was going on family holidays, you know, my dad would be walking around with a fucking one of those Sony <laughs> video cameras camera that, that he hired for the trip. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He bought it, bro. He was that committed. <laughs> Came in a fucking uh, briefcase and shit. <laughs> so wheel this thing out. Imagine if you saw a guy that committed walking around today, you'd be like, look at this prick walking mm. around here filming this shit for fucking YouTube. Who do you think you are? It's crazy though. That's the, that's the way but it is it's now. But it's sad because, you know, I've been with girlfriends or whatever or, 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 or you know, like relationships in the past and girls always love taking photos, right? Mm. And then you look back a year and a half later and they've sent you all these photos and you're like, oh, I would never have had any of these memories because yeah. I'm too fucking proud to take a photo. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's the downside, right? It's yeah. like, I'm too cool to take a photo exactly. and then you don't have any photos and of you're, memories. You're that guy. Yeah, so like fully. there's, there's got to be a happy medium somewhere and life is just finding that fucking happy medium. That's very true. <laughs> it now and it's like i don't have i just don't post anything mm. because i'm not taking selfies and i'm not pausing situations to be like hey let's get a photo because it feels like fucking unnatural but the reality is that this thing exists whether you want to be a part of it or not mm. and as you said like remove instagram and there would have been photos taken mm. so you're just writing yourself out of history by not actually exactly being part of it. right might, i mean that's something that i conscious of as well like just being more creative and Doing the things you love, you know, like. It's interesting though, because when we traveled together and I've traveled the world with both of you, taking photos was like a huge part of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For my birthday a few years ago, you gave me an album of photos of me that I'd never seen before and trips that we'd taken and stuff because I'm never going to be like, hey, give me those photos. Yeah. <laughs> Which is a completely reasonable thing to ask. I yeah. suppose. Can I have that album? So, <laughs> yeah. So I think that everyone, we were all kind of committed to taking photos of things. Mm. And because I was behind the lens, there's a hundred photos of you and vice versa. Yeah. And then, and that's the way it works. Right. But now maybe because I'm not traveling as much, I've never really found much inspiration in taking photos of places that I live. There also is that yeah. giant stigma. I mean, I was walking around the other day and I was walking down the road to my work and there was like a city of Perth bin and someone had dropped a ice cream cake, but it was like a unicorn colored ice cream cake. It was like <laughs> fucking glitter and purples and pinks and shit the contrast of this dirty bin and this sidewalk with mm. this beautiful cake that's been Art. smashed i was like this needs to be taken a photo of and i was like i'm not standing on the side of the road taking a photo of this like some fucking pleb and now i've missed that i it's, know it's sad that you kind of you don't do that do you like i'm exactly the same i'm like oh man i don't want anyone to see me take a photo yeah and like, you used to lie you used like, to lie like, on the fucking street taking dude, photos yeah. like for exactly. real like all of us have stopped situations to change lenses and stuff. You know what I mean? And it's like now, because it's an iPhone, it's like you need to feel like you're meant to be like covert with that, it. When the reality is that it's more socially acceptable now than it's ever been. That concept yeah. started early though. Like you remember back in the day, you know, just because you've got an iPhone doesn't mean you're a photographer. Mm-hmm. They've minimized the efficacy or, or the legitimacy of the iPhone 100%. as a photography tool for as long as it's been around. Naturally, when you see someone, especially if you come from a background, you've used a prop camera or mm. you've been involved in film or dark rooms or whatever, you automatically, this fucking loser. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird though. It's just all perception, right? Yeah? Because yeah. now you're like, I don't want to be that person. Who fucking cares? No shit. Yeah, exactly. Like, would you rather have these memories and these photos? Like, you're not going to be on your deathbed going, fuck. I'll tell you what, man, I wish I didn't take a photo of that ice cream bin. No shit. Man, I feel like we need to get our cameras and do a bit of a walk around one night. Uh, I've, got cameras, <laughs> I've got cameras everywhere in here. It's crazy. It's it's fully crazy. Because I got into it when I was, started putting music out and stuff. Because mm. it's like, you need to put out photos of stuff. And yeah. it just happened to coincide with me traveling and taking a ton of photos. It was part of the way that I saw a new place before I went to Chicago for the first time. And I'm like, let's go out and shoot some photos. And that's how you experience the city rather than being like, let's go and drink beers or like, Mm. I I suppose when 
when I got back from that trip and was just here and like as a musician, you're just sitting in a studio mm. and there's nothing to photograph there. And if there is, you need to kind of set it up and shoot yourself. Yeah, but and that isn't, feels it, isn't a bit that too- a cop out though? Like, isn't it the easiest to find inspiration in you? Uh, isn't it the hardest to find you know, originality in the mundane. Yeah, yeah, but that's why I don't do it because it's hard. (laughs) (laughs) It's one of the one things I do sort of regret. Like when I did go to hospital at the start, I think one of the first things I got Brody to bring in was my camera. And I look back and I wish I took more photos because I had this idea to like document it all, journal it, take photos, all that sort of stuff, like every day think i was too weak to do it you know i got to the point where I, like i'd pick up a glass of water and i'd drop it and it'd smash because i was so weak i kind of wish that somehow i found a way to do it and i did document it because now when i look back at the few photos i do have from that time like it really hits me hard and i'm like creates a new drive and a new spark and i kind of do wish like i had documented it and like made a little book or like something so i could then help other people and show the journey visually as well as you know in Plus it's posterity like it's it's like this happened because the story is a story and they change all the time and the memory is yeah. unreliable you said before you were telling a story and brody had to correct you on it like you have different versions yeah you have totally different versions i look back on photos of like travels i've had and stuff and that's what sparks the memories because you were having a moment and you stopped and you captured it. And whether you're capturing a moment or whether you were just in that kind of inspirational headspace at the time, yeah. where you were like, that looks beautiful to me now. Or I'm, I'm noticing something and I'm going to frame it and I'm going to capture this in time. When you don't do that, it is potentially because you lack presence when you're on holiday or when you're traveling, when you're seeing new things, you're stimulated mm-hmm. and you're like, I'm present in this moment. I'm here and I'm like, I'm gorging myself on what's in front of me. People will travel from all over the world if they could to come here and see all these beautiful things. But I I take it for granted and I'm not very present in the moment because I'm walking to work or I'm driving or I'm, you know, like I'm not going to go and walk down Aberdeen Street and take fellow depth of field photos of silhouettes because, yeah, Yeah. because it's it's not... Authentic. Yeah, it's not not that it's not authentic. I'm not there. Mm. I'm not present in that moment because there's yeah, yeah you stand because I'm thinking team. about like paying my fucking phone bill or I think that maybe it is just that being more present and I think it's f- see the beauty in things you know I think it's also about finding those moments as well like if we were to grab cameras now and walk around the city for an hour I guarantee we could find some stuff that we are inspired by or we look at shadows or you, you can find it if you want to it's funny, our old office on King Street, it's like the only red fire escape in Perth and it's probably the alleyway that looks least like Perth. You'd open this kind of like red door and that's, that would open onto the fire escape and that's how the fresh air would come in. You'd be sitting there and you just fucking... It's just kids would be like poking their head in because they were just there doing Instagram photo yep. shoots. And I feel negative towards that. <laughs> and it's like, no, you shouldn't feel negative towards that. But all right, well, I reckon we'll probably leave it there anyway. And thanks so much for joining us, Dwight. Appreciate thanks you, for having me, guys. It's an honor to be on the uh, on the podcast. So thanks for the invite. <laughs> Do we know anyone funny? Well, fuck, anyone's funny if we get some mushrooms. This is very true. <laughs> Maybe we should do a mushroom podcast. Oh, that sounds like a terrible idea. Not in Perth. The second podcast, we both got really stoned, and it was took a long time to edit. It did. So we're not doing that again. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I would be way smarter. Yeah. Turns out I just have much longer pauses <laughs> between saying sentences. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dwight. Honestly, Thanks, a pleasure having you Thank on. Thank you, brother. Thank Peace. You. Club good. Cheers. Oh. Club good. Club good. Club good.